somewhere nice. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Nancy does look like she's someplace wonderful with all that blue sky behind her. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, so great to see all of you and thank you for joining us on this gorgeous afternoon. We get just a beautiful, beautiful day. Um, That's interesting. <laughs> Where are you going? Oh. <laughs> oh. Is that Nancy? Yeah. Nancy, that's you. I think that um, yeah, it's very drifty. Carolyn, are you able to, to mute Nancy? I don't have that capability. I'm trying to, but it's not letting me for some reason. Oh. Huh. Well, Nancy, if you can hear us, uh, oh, maybe she's done it. She's gone. She's gone, huh? All right, well, hopefully she can get back to us, but we'll, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order and so we've got Mike, Lonnie, um, let's see who else is here. Carolyn, uh, Emma is at, in the attendees as well. I don't know if you saw her. Well, yep, I'm trying to move her over as well. Emma, and Emma Kate is, is calling in. And Kate's gonna be calling in, okay. Yeah, she's here, she's calling in, but I can't move her physically since she's on the phone. All right, terrific. And um, we don't have, Michael is going to be late, Rotemeyer. He said that he was going to come late. And so, and it doesn't look like Kenan is here or Bruce yet. So, um, so, and do we have any attendees? We've God. Oh, and uh, Rod and Mr. Walker, thank you so much for listening in and uh, always being here to participate. And uh, hey, Bruce, nice to see you as well. And Emma, wonderful. Okay, terrific. And so it looks like we've got everyone here except for Kenan and Nancy. Looks like she needs to duck out and Michael will be here a little bit later. And so we were going to go ahead and um, look at our review our agenda and so hopefully everybody got a chance to take a look at that and if we could go ahead oh kim thank you so much so here's our agenda for today so this meeting is being held pursuant to and oh gosh <laughs> I put my glasses on. <laughs> and in compliance with ordinance uh, number 20A16 in accordance to the, uh, an ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster, the opportunities for the public to access and participate in the electronic meeting are posted on the Almaral County website and on the Almaral County calendar when available. So welcome everybody. And there is our agenda. Could would somebody make a motion to approve this agenda? Um, before that, I would, I, there's something I'd like to include if we do have time. Um, I'd like to go over a, a new tool that I discovered called that, um, you know, for looking at records in the flora. But, you know, if, if we have time, it'd be nice to fit that in there. Sure, that sounds great. We'll, we'll stick that at um, other matters. How's that? Sounds fine. All right. I move to approve the agenda. Thank you, Bruce. And is I there, second it. Thank Peggy. you. Thank you, Peggy. And uh, Mike. 
do you approve? Um, I'm just going to do a roll call then. All right. Mike? Yes, I approve. All right. Uh, Emma. Yes. Lonnie. Aye. Leah. Yes. Emily. Yes. And uh, Bruce. you've got Bruce. Oh, Bruce. So. Uh, yeah, he moved. He motion. made the motion. Yeah. And how about motion. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Kate, I'm a yes too. Thank you, Kate. All right. Wonderful. And hopefully everybody got a chance to look at the minutes. Um, thank you so much, Kim. It was really helpful because there was a lot of information about spotted lantern flies. So those were so nicely recorded. Um, and if, uh, so that is the draft of the minutes that Kim sent out. Are there any questions about that or additions or changes? And if not, uh, does, can anybody move to approve those? I move, this is Lonnie, I move to approve the agenda. I'm sorry, move to approve the minutes, sorry. Catherine. Thank you, Lonnie. And a second on that? I second the Thank minutes. You. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, roll call. Mike. Uh, I'm gonna abstain. I, for some reason, did not get them. Sorry. Oh, huh. Sorry about that. I Oh, I, thought yeah, you were... I could have overlooked it. I don't. I don't oh, know. No. Well, it. we'll make sure you get a copy. Yeah. Of this. Sorry, Mike. Sorry. Uh, Emma. Do we get a thumbs up from you, Emma? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Hi, yeah. Emma. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Leah. Yes. Approved. Great. Wonderful. Uh, Emily, Aye. Yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Peggy, Aye. and uh, Kate. Kate, did you get a chance to look at the minutes? Yes, yeah, so I didn't hear you call my name, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Kate. Okay, and I guess you are giving it, you approve. Yes, that is correct. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. We are going to I move. Missed, I think you missed me, but I. Oh, Lonnie, yes. Do I need to call on you if you made the motion? Yeah. Okay. All right. Lonnie is an I. And then Bruce? I. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for keeping us straight, Lonnie. Um, thank you. And so. Does anybody have, did anybody have an opportunity to take a look at an important site or visit an important site or do any outreach uh, that you would like to report upon now? We're gonna have a discussion a little bit later on about important sites in general and discuss uh, Emma's beautiful spot that she has. But just wanted to make sure that we leave a place marker uh, if anybody did have an opportunity to visit an important site or do some outreach and report back on that. Would like to say that uh, I want to thank Michael for um, sharing his now, costume. Now that the weather's a little better, I might do do it, but it would just been too miserable to do anything from my end. <laughs> I, I've got you on that one, Peggy. Uh, now that fall has come, we can all get back into the woods, hopefully. Mike, I'm sorry, you got cut off. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I did get a chance to uh, get a copy of the Biodiversity Action Plan, which has all the information in it that I can now review and, and get out and see. So I want to thank Michael for uh, meeting me and uh, Kim helping with that. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, you can check out some of the ones that are up in your neck of the woods there, which will be already in the in the paperwork. So I'm anxious to get out there. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I do, I can give you guys a little update on the Blenheim Prairie since I see that quite often and it is, uh, it's looking great. There is this whole spot where all this jewel weed has come up and um, I managed to get the multiflora rose that had been taking over and got that hacked down and I think killed. And one thing that's cool is there's some giant ragweed and it must be 
10 or 12 feet tall. And so I didn't even know there was a giant ragweed, but there is. <laughs> it is a pretty impressive plant. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's there. It's, it's a native and it is important for several species of pollinators. So it's, it's actually, for, from a wildlife habitat perspective, it's a good thing. Yeah. For, for your allergies, if you have allergies, maybe not. Yeah, I did look it up and I saw that it was, did provide a lot of, um, was important for wildlife. So I was excited about that. And it's way up there for the birds to enjoy all those seeds, seed heads. Um, all right. Well, if we, there are no other updates about important sites, uh, I wanted to just do a follow-up on the spotted lanternfly. And I wanna thank Emma for creating, she created a Google folder with uh, some great information in there. Um, so that was really helpful. And Kim was able to get, um, you know, gather some of those materials and send them out to Cape. And hopefully all of you got an opportunity to see the notice that they sent out, which I thought was really great. And then um, Mike has been uh, really, and Mike and Kim have both made some efforts to try to connect with the economic development people at Alm in Alma County. So thank you for those, uh, the efforts that you've put forward with that. I wrote a letter to uh, the Board of Supervisors and um, sent that out. And then I also met with uh, Jim Barber and he was kind enough to laminate some of the flyers. So I, was, I put them, I placed them in some of the parks and he had already put some up. So if you go to the parks, I think you will find them there. Uh, but then I, I put them all up in Scottsville, <laughs> sort of the places that I have been uh, going by. And I also just want to report the the master gardeners. They set up a help desk at the Charlottesville City Market, mm -hmm. and they uh, were talking to people about it. And they had a nice poster. That I think Virginia Tech had uh, given them, and it was just interesting because I was volunteering with them. It was a, a week before last, and when you really engaging people with this question, a lot of people had already heard. I would say you know, 80% of the people that we talked to um, had heard something about the spotted lantern fly. So I think that's a good sign uh, that the message- I've been sharing information in-house, you know, with the Monticello staff newsletters and um, other people I know. I also, um, I guess it'd be a good idea to put maybe a poster up somewhere else in, in at um, Secluded Farm and, and the Monticello Trail. Um, I'll talk to Julie about that if they yeah. allow them. Um, and also um, I attended a APGA, American Public Gardens Association, had a week long <clears throat> um, kind of Zoom workshop on, on uh, <clears throat> not just spotted lanternfly, but other <clears throat> invasive insects. So I attended that and that was pretty interesting too. <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> something got my throat. <laughs> that's that's great, Peggy. Yeah, I also yeah. I did create like a Google spreadsheet where I have I have yet to actually put in the places where I in the actions I've taken, but it would might be nice if we just uh, made a note of what we've done and at least we can document where we know that there are that we as a committee have done that outreach and see if there's any holes. Um, you know, for me is like, well, just getting the flyers and cause I don't have a printer. So it was really nice, but Jim Barber was, uh, I think if you wanted to connect with him and just go to the County office building, uh, he's there most of the time, or he'll leave the flyers with you. So if you wanted to get a stack of 10 or 20 and you know, you have some County stores that you visit or a library that you want to put them up. Um, he's been just great about that. Christine, I had a brief comment about um, an additional email that we had from, uh, from Kyle. I know you reached out to him by phone. Uh, he sent us an email back that uh, talked about a follow-up meeting would be great. Want to make sure that uh, the Virginia Vineyard Association and the Winery Association were both uh, touched, that we were able to, somebody was able to touch base with them um 
there were a couple of folks with VDAX that he had included initially when we were trying to set up a, uh, a Zoom meeting. That did not happen, um, but they're they're connected, and I have their information. He did say he wanted to, uh, would want uh, wineries and vineyards uh, to be active on their landscapes. And at this point, it would be important to, rep uh, to kill and report any life stages of the spotted lanternfly. And uh, I was questioning about a list of Albemarle County wineries. How did they want, how did he suggest we kill them, we want to trap them, and how to, how to report? So those are some things that are still to do's that. Uh, I'd like to follow up with and and Kim maybe stay in touch with you and and uh, see if there's some things that we can follow up on. I do want to thank you for the article you sent, uh, Christine. Uh, all 18 pages of it. Um, there were quite a number of suggestions that I had uh, gathered from that. Uh, two of which I think are 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 uh, interesting to consider. Call center and a uh, spotted lanternfly website. The, what, there might be a website out there already, uh, but the call center is something that the state of Pennsylvania has done. Um, so other folks have tried some things and uh, hopefully Virginia will be able to do some, some similar things as well. Yeah, and I know uh, Rod Walker has been you know, involved in talking at the state level. So, and then Rod has, anything he'd like to add to that. But I, I think that's interesting that Kyle had, I like the idea of going, being able to go to the vineyards and actually um, seeing the possibility of like setting up a trap, uh, traps there or really, cause now apparently now is when they're on the move. And Kim, I was thinking maybe this to reach out to Serena and then have another notice go out which would be a little bit different, like the lanternfly is on the move. And maybe this is the way you're really looking for that adult stage and making sure that it's reported because that will go on you know, into the fall. Yeah, we can do um, a, you know follow up outreach. Um, and, and I just wanted to follow on Michael's comment too that I've, uh, been in contact with our communications office and I think generally you know we don't have staff that are have the expertise of you know like cooperative extension and VDAX and they're already creating they have a website they have a place to report you know they have all these great flyers and information so I think if we are able to provide the information that they have um, that's probably going to be the best route rather than counting recreating something uh, or creating something new um, but we can certainly do another alert like we did before. And then the Economic Development Office has contacts, you know, of the winery associations and they are um, the Monticello Wine Trail and they're happy to put out information. But I want to have this meeting. Um, we have a doodle poll out right now that Michael alluded to, to uh, the VDAX folks in VCE. So I'm trying to set up that conversation so I can clarify you know, what's recommended for the wineries to do. Um, and so that we're giving them the message, you know, that that is, you know, the most appropriate message for how to manage on their lands. Um, because I don't have the expertise to know exactly what that is. And there seems to be conflicting evidence out there about what, what we should tell them to do. <laughs> Other than report, everybody should report. Um, so anyway, just at, wanted to add that. Thanks, Kim. My, I'd like my, to add... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, my number one recommendation for communications, I really wish they'd get a next door account um, so that they could send things as official communications from Albemarle County. It's a great way to reach neighborhoods, particularly rural neighborhoods that don't have HOAs. Um, I did forward the um, spotted, lantern fly, spotted lantern fly notice to, um, to the Sugar Hollow next door into the Crozet area, but there's next door um, neighborhoods all across the county. The, the police already use it. Um, so it'd be really great to see um, Amaral get an official account. Um, that's a great way to directly I, reach people. This is Kate, and I'd like to push back on any official communications going to places that are like that, that are restricted. That just seems counterintuitive to me. I, it's important to get information out, 
but the county provides information to everyone by mechanisms that every single citizen can very easily sign up for. I think it creates a whole lot more work to be posting to individual Nextdoor accounts. And I personally have found Nextdoor to be a pretty obnoxious resource. I'm not saying anything about the Sugar Hollow Nextdoor individual ones, but I, I just, doesn't that make a whole lot more work for communications folks when they're doing a great job of putting out email and things like that? I mean, I guess it's the difference of people have to, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I find it useful. Um, I think it's a good way to, I mean, a lot of people don't think to sign up for email. Um, it's, it's a good way to target neighborhoods. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's yeah, not perfect. I'm only, I'm only it's not perfect. But. Because then it, it's information that's segmented and going to certain groups and not other groups. So that's my worry. Really, well, is if no, I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't say send it to just next door. I would say send it to email, obviously. You know, I'd send it to the normal communication channels. But if you could also post it to um, post it next door, that'd be great too. In fact, I got... I've gotten um, requests, you know, cause I started the next door neighborhood for Sugar Hollow and, and I've gotten requests from people like, can you send this out as an official communication? Um, like people wanted to, me to send out the fire notices. Um, and I said, I can't do that. I can only send it out as myself. Um, but you know, like letting people know that there are fire restrictions in effect, you know, other things like that. It just, it'd be more effective if it didn't come from me. Well, since it's, we probably don't have any control over that other than um, perhaps making the recommendation, I'm sure that, you know, decision for other people to make, but that doesn't keep all of us. I know I'm, I am part of the next door, even though I rarely use it for the Southern Almoral, I could certainly post that. So, you know, if that's a good way to communicate, then perhaps we should all be doing it in our areas. Christine, I had to, one other comment. Uh, yeah. I, I have had good response back from Cathcart, who does property management for our, our HOA, as to kind of get our foot in the door with the potential HOA industry here in Charlottesville, Albemarle, not only for Spotted Lanternfly, but for anything that we would try to get out, want to get out to uh, residents that are part of HOAs. Uh, I haven't had a meeting with them yet, but they, I've sent them an email. I've gotten a positive um, indication back from them that, you know, as, as we can get some time with all the other things that are going on, uh, certainly have a, have a conversation with them about potential for doing something like that. I think that's really exciting, Mike. And I think there's a lot of possibilities uh, because as you said, they're managing a lot of property. And if we can, pass on some good stewardship practices for them to consider. That's great. Yeah, well, they may give us a lead into the, you know, whoever the HOA industry is in, I say industry uh, in Charlottesville so that we could push it to one group, one organization and it goes out to everybody. So that's yeah. kind of what my goal is. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Rod or Mac, is that Rod? I'm here. Oh, hi. <laughs> Hi, Rod. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, uh, a couple of quick comments. You know, one, one is, first of all, I've seen a couple of the communications that go out and you know, kudos to you guys. I think you're doing great. Uh, I, I, I think all the ideas are, that I hear here are, are all relevant and sound good. Uh, however, there, there is one topic I would like to, to put back on the table. Uh, in terms of communications, which is my, my fear, of course, is that with all the, the different methods we're talking about, you know, we would be lucky uh, if, if half the landowners in the county actually saw, saw any one of these things. Uh, and so I, I would suggest, uh, if not urge, you to, to at least take a hard look at sending out a communication directly to every landowner in the county uh, one hundred percent coverage, uh, at least once. And of course, the timing here is really sensitive because this the season is is peaking with the adults coming out. Uh, and when the first frost hits, they're going to pretty much all disappear. So we we have a relatively short window here in front of us, you know, for seeing the actual bugs. Uh, and I, I'm sure it's not cheap. On the other hand, I don't expect it to be radically expensive uh, to 
you know, actually go out and, and send something to literally every landowner in the county. And, and there has to be a way to do that. Uh, so for, for, for what it's worth, I, I, would, I would really suggest doing that. Uh, and, and two other tidbits. One, one, one is uh, in Pennsylvania in a four month period, they had 16,000 calls you know, coming into their call center. So yeah, it's, it, 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 phone calls are a big deal. And, and the other thing was, uh, Kim, if, if you set up that phone, phone call or Zoom meeting with the industry folks, et cetera, uh, if, if you feel it's appropriate, uh, I'd, I'd love to be invited and, and see if I can contribute. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I can add you, Rod. That would be great. I think you make a good case, Rod. I, I think one way to put this too is that, I mean, I think a, a mass mailing to everyone in, in Abmore County has got to be cheaper than quarantine. Yeah. Well, it, it, I think that's exactly the point, which is the economic consequences of this <laughs> are huge. Uh, and, and the cost of doing so, some of these actions is peanuts by comparison. Yeah, if I could just jump in, I, I don't want to cut in front of Emily. I see other folks have their hands raised, but um, just to respond to that, I, I did want to add um, two things. One is that I've been talking with Kyle and trying to facilitate getting him on to the supervisor's uh, agenda so he can address them directly and explain um, some of this, especially about you know the quarantine and, and what the consequences of that might be. Um, but I've also been talking about internally coordinating a county response. And I don't know if that would be outreach like you're talking about, Rod. Um, but I have I think there are some other possibilities in terms of um, you know, working on county lands to control tree of heaven potentially, which you've suggested as well. Um, but basically my first goal is just to bring it to everyone's attention at the highest level so that we can um, just bring it to their attention and then hopefully encourage uh, some kind of more coordinated county response. So I am also going on that track as well, but it's it's not um, it's it's not in anyone's work plan, of course. And I understand there's an urgency to the situation, but <laughs> there's that aspect too. So um, it's just it's just a little tough, but working along those that track as well. So I we've heard that and are, I'm trying to respond to it. Yeah, I mean, and, and taking it to the supervisors, I think is terrific. I, I think that's 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 very appropriate and, 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 a, and a good thing to do. Uh, I would just encourage you to have in your back pocket, you know, you know, the options when they say, okay, well, what do you want us to do? Yeah, well, here's three things and here's what they cost. Here's what it takes to do it. That's a good point. Yeah. They could put it, they could pin up their little postcard and they'd have it say, pin it up so you look at it every day. Know what the spotted lantern fly. <laughs> Thank you. Emma. Yes, I, um, well, I have something really quick to add on the um, talk about the wineries. I reached out to Kirstie Harmon, who is the winemaker at Blenheim Winery, and I asked her advice on the best um, way to spread information to area winemakers. And she suggested the Monticello Wine Trail, which um, Kim had also just mentioned. So maybe once we, and she gave me the information for the president, um, who is really, she, she said he's really great at communication and he's got a lot of reach. So if we can, come a letter or like once we know the um, suggestions we want to give, which perhaps isn't just rem uh, removing and killing the Lanthus. Is that incorrect to be um, suggesting to winemakers? Because that's what I wrote to her. Um, anyways, um, then we can send it out. And she also suggested that for wider community outreach, we could um, reach out to farmers markets and CSAs to share to their um, customers. Um, but, but I also think just real quick, like why can't we do a targeted ad on social media, like for the county? Like that just feels like super simple. Everyone's on their phones and then people can just, start to see it and then they can click through to the information. I, I feel like that is a, a good way to get a lot of reach, but, and it's simple, super simple and easy. 
but that's just my two cents. I, Emma, I think you, you are on it. We need to get you on the communications team. <laughs> well, yeah. We could do a TikTok dance too. That's probably. That would do it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That would get the younger, the younger kids. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Leah and then Emily. Leah, I was just going to say that I first heard about the lantern fly at least a year ago uh, through the Master Naturalist, and within a couple of weeks, I reached out to a winery that's just five minutes from me, where I know the owners. And they said that they had already had um, received information from the winery association, whatever it is called, and that they had information on it. And they had shared that with their groundskeeper uh, to keep a lookout for the ailanthus tree and the um, spotted lanternfly. And I told them that they had um, the ailanthus trees at the edge of their property. And she just kind of like blew me off because their groundskeeper would take care of it. But my point is that the winery industry has apparently been a little bit on top of this. And maybe rather than us reinventing the wheel, we can figure out a way to support them um, rather than us trying to go in on our own in terms of reaching out to wineries. Yeah, it, it does seem like they, they do have knowledge of it. And um, I'm wondering if just, I don't know if they would be open to it, but asking them to uh, put post, post the flyer at the winery, I don't know. But, you know, perhaps just having it brought to their attention that as many times as possible, I don't think it hurts too much, but good point, creating that right. collaboration. Yeah, reiterating it is always a good thing. I just thought I'd mention that there is some kind of an association that at least, at least probably the more established wineries are active in. Right. Emily. Yeah, and I think, oh, sorry to cut oh. over, but um, just really quick to respond to Leah. Um, I, I totally agree with you. And that part of the reason I want to talk with VCE is that I think VCE has done some of that outreach to the wineries. And so before Michael and other folks go ahead and do all this, I think it would be helpful to have that conversation um, to understand exactly what's already been done. So it's not just a duplication of effort, although maybe that would be helpful, but to do, um, you know, to just uh, have that understanding first. Yeah, thank you. Emily. Yeah, just real quick. Um, when I was reading over the notes and I saw that it was um, still meadow, that part of the Ravana Trail, I guess, um, I realized, you know, that's, that's kind of crossed the river from my neighborhood, which is Benavar, which goes down to the um, confluence of the rivers there. And um, I'm not sure it said that VDAX had reached out to landowners on both sides of the river. I'm not sure whether they covered my neighborhood. I asked my husband, do you remember seeing something? I don't remember seeing anything. He probably would have showed it to me, but he was like, I kind of feel like I saw something. Um, but getting to that idea of HOAs, like we are a neighborhood that doesn't really have a formal HOA, there are no HOA fees or something, but we do have an informal like um, sort of email list to the neighborhood. There is a, a person who's organized and sends out like sort of important news to the neighborhood and then the Profit Road Area Association, there has been sort of an email list that's literally like very old school, like you're you know, you get an email that has like this many <laughs> lines of people's email addresses, but um, those might be the kind of places if we have something that's like a flyer or an email form, um, if you sent it to me, I could pass it on to the people who are in charge of those lists, because it sounds like, I mean, this is potentially in some of the, especially one side of Benever neighborhood um, is, is directly across from Still Meadow. And we have plenty of Ilanthus in the neighborhood. <laughs> Drives me nuts. <laughs> Go on walks. I'm like, Ilanthus, Ilanthus. Oh no, Ilanthus in a, you know, like a, a nicely groomed lawn, you know, like where they're like saving those trees to have. Yeah. So um, anyway, I just didn't know if there was anything like that, but happy to, to sort of send it on to a couple of people who are in charge of email addresses for this neck of the woods. Yeah, I think even uh, forwarding the email uh, that came. Okay, that, that's true. That might be a good idea. 
yeah, that I think that that would be good. And uh, yeah, I when we were doing a litter campaign, I ended up having a list of HOAs that I could actually send to the, I have the, the names, the emails of the presidents of those HOAs. So I don't think that that would hurt to do that in addition to our own little next door. And as Emma said, get on TikTok and <laughs> see what you can do to spread the word there. Yeah, no, those, those ideas make sense to me. Like I said, I mean, it is, if you're going to spread the word, sometimes it's, it's got to be kind of informal. Like I said, there's no formal HOA. You're not going to, you're, you're probably not going to turn up somebody to talk to unless you know somebody in the neighborhood, you know. I think that's something that we can do. And so, you know, I just encourage everybody like Peggy has done through your networks to just uh, spread the word as much as possible. Yeah, I, I should I should send something to the Piedmont Virginia Bird Club too, since you know they're out and about. So yeah, I'd be uh, crazy, of course. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Rod. Yeah, not not, not to, yeah not not to overdo the point, but yeah, if you want to help out the wineries and the vineyards, yeah, arguably one of the most important things you can do for them. Uh, is to make sure that all the landowners around them yeah, are aware of the problem and are taking action on their lanthus. That would actually help yeah, the, the, the vineyard owners. Yeah, that's a good point, kind of targeting those areas. And perhaps there are ways to um, help the land, those uh, vineyards do that. Well, I was, like in my in my letter I wrote to Kirsty, I asked if we if we created like um, some sort of like uh, image for their social media or just provided them the information if she thought that the wineries and like the local businesses would be <clears throat> interested in sharing those with their people who follow them because most likely a lot of them live nearby a lot of the people who follow them on social media. And how did she, did she thought, think that was a good idea? If we have that to provide a Monaco um, wine trail, like, you know, for wineries, to, you know, just a little package that they can share with their followers or put out on their email or whatever. Like a little media package. Yeah, a little media package. Yeah. All right, Kim, well, we'll go wait for you to hear back. Uh, and Mike, both of you guys are working on that, so. Yeah, and I think it's fine to, you know, go ahead if you have ideas, um, you know, to, we can continue on this track as well. But, um, and I'll share, if you don't already have it, the county news alert, you can share it as a link to the web page instead of forwarding the email, which people are less likely to read. So I can share that and it's in a, a better format, I think, for sharing. That's, that would be great. Yeah, I think that's just a great place to start with that piece of uh, media that's been created already. So, all right, you guys, that is, it's a big project and a big problem, <laughs> potential. <laughs> so anyhow, thanks, thanks for everybody who has uh, contributed and helped us spread the word on that. Um, we are, so the next thing is, I'm really excited to have Kim give us an update on all the amazing things that she has been up to. Thanks, Christine. Um, so I, uh, Christine asked me to give a, an, a staff update and I have put together a few slides that I'll share just to keep myself on track and to share some photos with you guys as well. Um, and it's a lot, but I don't want to take up too much time because I know we have, um, I want to leave time for the important sites discussion. Um, but I did want to share some of the things um, that I've been up to. And uh, so the main thing, the biggest thing that I've done, and I put 80% here, just an estimate of my time, um, this stream health initiative that David Hanna started before me has been a really big project. Um, and it's definitely been dominating my time for the past year. Um, we did have a work group for the rural area um, 
strategies and Lonnie participated in that. Um, and so in July, I presented 16 strategies to the board. Um, they fall into these three categories, the regulations, incentives and voluntary opportunities and monitoring education and partnerships. Um, that third category does include the new landowner education project that uh, our this education subcommittee has started. So um, there's a lot of excitement around that and support for it. So um, that's something that we might expand and formalize through the stream health initiative. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm not going to go through all those strategies that we're, we're now um, developing into proposals because this developed questionnaire is open on the public input site right now. So you can go and read about each one if you're interested um, and also provide feedback on, you know, whether you support them or not. Um, so I think I have the link here. Yeah, and we're working on developing those into proposals now. So scoping out what each one would mean with respect to cost and staffing um, and timelines um, and just providing a little bit more de analysis and detail to the board. So that will go to the board in December. And then hopefully we'll have some direction as to, you know, which of those we'll move forward with. Um, so this is, if you all, I, I know a lot of you are already familiar with this, but I wanted to put it up just um, for the newer folks who, and, and any guests that might not have visited. Um, and if you want to look at the questionnaire, I know Christine forwarded it as well um, to provide feedback on those strategies. So, um, so that's a big thing. And then um, I wanted to share some more about the connectivity project in the Southern Albemarle Mountains, um, since there was a lot of interest in that, and I got some separate emails from some of you also about it. Um, and I, um, so uh, this is looking at wildlife corridors and particularly improving these crossings along Route 29, um, potentially. So right now we're just studying them. Um, there's five of these crossing sites, um, mostly branches of the hardware, but then also Cove Creek, which is the furthest south towards Nelson County. And I, um, this is, even though it's, I have a few slides about it and some photos to share, it's really just like less, per, less than 1% of my time because I, it's not in my work plan right now. Um, and I, I hope it will be at some point in the future, but uh, I've really a little time to devote to it. But their camera traps are out and I am collecting the data um, and working with VDOT and Wild Virginia and PEC um, so we'll see where that all leads. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential with the statewide support for the Wildlife Collaborative. Um, so some of the enhancements we're looking at at these different crossing sites, uh, improving access to the approaches where wildlife come down to these underpasses, um, improving some of the pathways along them. Uh, some of the culverts really fill up with sediment, so uh, clearing some of that out and maybe installing fencing uh, at a couple of sites, and then uh, lighting as well. Um, and then I talked last time a little bit about the roadkill survey. Um, the, there are master naturalists that have signed up to work on that, so that's really exciting. And um, I think next week they're going to be starting. Lonnie, did you have a question? Yeah, just um, as I'm sure you're aware, the um, 29 crossing of the Hardware River is also near one of our biodiversity sites. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, at the North Fork, and I, I'd love to visit that sometime. I know, um, uh, uh, so you, you know, the landowner, some folks. So that would be that would be really interesting. Um, just, just let me know when, and I I have his email, and he's very receptive okay. to people visiting. Yeah, maybe next summer when it's a good time to look at flora, or um, so. So, but yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, so I was going to just related to this, um, share just a couple photos just to show you what some of these sites, what is happening at some of the sites and what they look like. So, um, this picture is at the North Fork where that site is, Lonnie, I believe, um, wetland over here, but, uh, this, um, this is a pathway that goes under the bridge. This is just one section of the bridge. And so what happens is the deer come along, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but they follow this pathway and not just deer, other wildlife as well. And then the path just ends here in the median. Um, so they either go in the water or they go up in the median in the middle of the highway. Um, so one, so two things that might help improve this area is like creating an actual path 
slope contouring the slope where um, there the path can go all the way across and then also some fencing along this median that is kind of a one way fencing so they can come down from the median but they can't go back up into the road. Um, so that's kind of cool and I just wanted to share this photo of a fawn nursing that was right in front of the camera trap amazingly because um, I, I, I think that's just really neat. Um, and that's on the other side of, of this uh, large bridge. Um, and then this is a really different site, just for contrast. Each one of them is really different, are really different, but this is at Cove Creek all the way to the south. Um, and this is a site where this there's this double culvert. It's all wet, um, but it's very long culvert. And apparently um, that's a barrier for wildlife when they can't see all the way to the other side. So so. Um, one simple enhancement that could happen here is just lighting uh, inside the culvert. Um, and we are documenting through the camera traps a lot of uh, approach and retreat from wildlife where they come up and they go in a third of the way or halfway and then they come back out because it's just too long and too dark. Um, so, so that's another interesting site. And of course, if VDOT is ever scheduled to replace these structures, which is not on their agenda right now, but at some day they will. Um, we'll have a lot of recommendations for how they could do that to, um, to put in a better structure. <clears throat> and this one I just wanted to share because it looks like he's posing for Westminster or something. Um, just a cool photo right in front of the camera trap. Um, so a few other work items really quick I wanted to share with you uh, in case you weren't aware. I'm I am one of the members of the climate program team and uh, Gabe Daly, who's the program manager, just gave an update to the board yesterday. Um, I haven't watched it yet, but you can watch the recording if you wanna get caught up on what's happening with the climate action plan and the climate program team. Um, I also have been doing a lot of environmental review um, of different projects throughout the county, um, development projects. Uh, I've been participating also in the James Riparian Consortium, uh, mainly got involved in that related to the Stream Health Project, um, but that's just this really interesting network of folks, um, all from, you know, nonprofit, private, uh, government, all working towards the same goals of, you know, improving uh, water quality and stream health and increasing buffers in the James watershed. So um, really interesting ideas and work coming out of that group that that uh, I hope to share and and bring some of that to Albemarle if I can. Um, also working with our land conservation programs, um, the ACE ordinance update is still in progress. Uh, I just got an update from our legal team yesterday, so hopefully I can continue to keep pushing that forward with the biodiversity criteria. Um, and then uh, uh, I hopefully, or I won't get too excited, but the Invasive Plant Task Force is on my list as something that I hope we can do with county parks in the future. Um, I've talked with Christine about that a bit and with um, some folks from Parks and Rec, and they are hiring right now, I believe, for, um, it's not this exact same position as Dan Mahan's old position, but there will be um, a new employee that I think will be uh, in a good place to work with me on that in the future, hopefully um, at some point soon. So that's it. That's all I have. If there's questions, I'm happy to take them. Lonnie, yeah. Yeah, so um, I can't recall. So for, for ACE, what 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 width of buffer, buffer do we, we require for the ACE program? Um, I think it's variable and negotiable, but they, they um, and Leah actually is on the committee, right? So Leah, you might be better placed to answer, but my understanding is that only recently they voted to have required buffer, and I believe it's 35 feet is the minimum. Leah, can you confirm that? That sounds right to me, yeah. Only on perennial streams, did I say that? Yeah. So, so no, no buffer on intermittent, no buffer required for intermittent streams on, and. And I broached that Lonnie, because I absolutely believe it should be required, um, especially if it's a purchase of an easement, but the ACE committee did not support my request to include that in the update. Well, that's, that's unfortunate. Um, the other, the other um, question would be, I, 
and I, I assume the answer is yes, but with the climate committee, it's it's great that you're on sort of both doing the stream health and the climate committee. Is there much discussion about the co-benefits of stream buffers and the trees within stream buffers in terms of climate? Um, well, the climate team, the climate action plan, you know, they're only just beginning the, to, to work towards implementation. So um, that is, but I am trying to raise that discussion. So I don't know if you recall, but when I presented to the board in July, I put all of the um, corresponding strategies and recommendations from both the climate action plan and from the biodiversity action plan into the stream health strategy so that you could see kind of cross-reference where those strategies overlap. Uh -huh. um, and I'm looking to ways to do that, maybe even in, in a better way when we bring it back in December. Um, so yes, I, and I think the other thing the climate program team is doing is looking at what work is already going on and how they can support or build on that rather than, um, you know, to, to um, further the climate goals and, as and well. Are you looped into this the soil health coalition and the discussions occurring there about soil health and BMPs and carbon sequestration? Okay. Does, does anybody else have any questions or? I, if not, I just wanna thank you, Kim, uh, for all the work you're doing. And I do wanna encourage people to uh, go to the questionnaire and look at some of those uh, recommendations. I thought just the whole program is well done, the way you can really get a sense of uh, what is being proposed and it is an opportunity for you to provide some input. And um, so I just recommend that you do, that you do go ahead and do that. All right. Well, thanks. I think it's ex always exciting to hear all the things that you're up to and uh, to get a sense of, you know, the progress that is being made. So thank you. Thank you, you Kim. I just want to say I drive over that North Fork Bridge every day, twice a day. So I'll keep an eye out now. I mean, Riddle's Crossing, just, just beyond it. Um, but I'm really excited that you um, are working on that these projects. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, that one's a tricky spot because it's such a busy intersection. But there, but I, as you could see from the picture, there is there are some things that we could do to help facilitate movement under the in, under at the underpass. Yep, definitely. And what a simple solution putting a light in some some of those uh, long culverts. Was that a bear that was in one of the photographs that looked like a dark spot? No, just a dark spot. <laughs> All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions or comments, uh, I want to move on uh, to talk about, I just want to bring up this idea of, and maybe it's my lack of, uh, I missed something along the way, or those of you who've been on the committee longer than I have, is setting up some kind, kind of criteria for evaluating when does when do we say something is an important site? And I did share with you, uh, I'm looking to the map right now and there's a description of the important site. And I, I sent that out to you as you know, part of that uh, county's biodiversity work group. Um, really looking for it says, represent a, a locations of special natural plant communities, unusual habitats or species rare or scarce in Albemarle County. And those of you who've been on the committee longer than I have, Nancy, uh, I'm trying to think, Lonnie, Peggy, are there other, am, am I missing something? No, I mean, I would say that the most important thing there are natural communities, right? So if you if you just have one rare plant um, and nothing else, then that rare plant probably doesn't stand a very good chance of survival. And it, it may not have the conservation benefit you think it does. 
Um, so what, you're really, what we really want to determine with some of these places, so you, you find a, an occurrence of a rare plant, but you really need to get someone out there to visit the site and, and do some more documentation. And so, and actually determine what, what kind of natural community it is. If you go to DCR, you can see lists of natural communities um, and so I think it's important for us to start actually identifying which natural community it is that we're talking about. Um, and, then, and, then, um, and then determine what other species may be present to get a real picture of what that community is. Um, and, and I think that's the thing that ultimately should drive the determination of whether, um, whether something should be a special site or not. Does anyone else want to add to that? I'll just chime in and say that I agree with Lonnie that I think the natural community is is, is really important. Um, and, you know, as I think most everybody who's familiar with Devin's work, um, that that is a lot of what he is doing is using the techniques um, of collecting data to determine what kind of natural community it is. I'm um, using the same kind of techniques that DCR uses. Um, and so I would say, you know, he is a friend of the committee. And if there are places that, you know, might have potential, I think we've done this in the past, invited him to, to take a team out there and, and determine that, that that's a, that that's a good option. Um, but, you know, that we also ought to try to, you know, maybe work on expertise on the committee as well to, to, to get more familiar with those communities ourselves. But yeah, and, and I think there's there's sort of degrees of that approach. I mean, Devin, Devin really has a gold standard locally, I think He's, he does a great job. Um, there's something um, far short of what Devin does where you can get a good picture of the plants and animals that are growing there. And you can, with a reasonable certainty, get it down to the closest natural community that it probably is. Um, you know, I do think it's, it's good. I think, um, if we can get to the point where we, we have expertise to lay out plots, that'd be fantastic. I don't know if we will, um, but at least familiarizing ourselves with the natural communities. Um, and after this, someone can share the link to the DCR natural communities site. Um, I mean, I think that's the first step. I'm, I'm wondering, Devin, I mean, uh, yeah, getting Devin involved would be great, but Lonnie, would you mind or the policy committee taking a stab at actually creating sort of a list of criteria uh, that we can formalize a little bit more? Uh, this yeah, idea that's of, of uh, creating an important site to give us a little bit more guidance I, I think that's, yeah, I think that's fine. Um, uh, Carolyn, since so she's a clerk, I mean, that I guess we can add that to our agenda for the upcoming meeting. Yeah. The Nature Conservancy's criteria, I mean, that's, you know, that's what they promote too, is to preserve communities, not just, you know, places where there's a few rare plants. So, I mean, there, there may be some language in there um, mission statements or whatever that can be useful to the Nature Conservancy, yeah. Yeah, and I think the other thing the Nature Conservancy tries to do is um, intentionally try to get representative community types. So they, they sort of, they think of it like a portfolio, right? So they, they say, well, what are the natural community types that um, may be, you know, worthy of protection and then try to get representative natural community types, as many of representative community types as they can. So if they already have, um, if they already have a lot of longleaf pine savanna, then they're going to say, well, "All right, well, 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 maybe there's you know a um, maybe the, maybe there's some Piedmont, Piedmont mafic um, rock baron that we need as well." You know, so they're trying to like put together a portfolio of different types of communities that they protect. And I'm not saying we should necessarily do that, but I think it is it is worth um, taking into account. We are just doing a plant community. We also have uh, the eagle nesting sites, for example. 
So we'd have to figure out um, how, how or, or why to include them. I didn't catch all that. Could you say that again? We don't have just uh, plant communities. We have the eagle nesting sites, for instance. So we want to think about other, um, maybe other ways of defining it, or or additional ways of defining what we think would come under the heading of important sites. I think that's a very important um, thing to bring up. I think the eagle sites were included because at the time it was a federally endangered species. Um, and so I think taking into account um, federal status is certainly something that may be one of the exceptions to the rule is if something has federal status, then, then maybe it becomes a, a special site, even if that's the only thing there. Um, but, you know, what do you do about something like eagles that now don't have federal, I don't think they have any federal status now, do they? I mean, or did they drop to threatened? I don't know. And also, uh, they could be transitory as well. So it would be interesting to know if those eagles are still nesting in those places. So uh, Leah, you had your hand up and then Kim. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm assuming when we're talking plant communities, we're talking ones that have already been pre-identified and designated? Because like I know there's a guide from DCR and I think I've seen another guide somewhere else. And then it sounds like if Nature Conservancy has done work, they've, they've printed a guide <laughs> probably. Yeah, I think we'd, we'd use the DCR, we'd use the DCR standard for, for natural communities. Okay. Um, and they kind of have, if you, if you look at how they, DCR does it, they sort of have, a, Multi tiers. They sort of have like sort of a general classification, and then they break it down very, very specifically. Um, I think at a minimum we should at least get the upper level classification of the natural community. Yeah, I just uh, want to follow on um, what Nancy said. Well, I had the same question about the eagle nesting sites, just because I, they were delisted. So I imagine when they were recognized as important sites, they were more important at that time. So that's something to consider maybe, but, um, and I, I fully support um, the natural community approach um, that um, the natural, the statewide natural heritage programs um, do use that, but they also track species. And I would, I guess, suggest that, I don't know if you wanna look at it as different tiers or whether you don't call that an important site, maybe you call it something else, um, but there's different things they look at. They look at rarity and they look at quality. So, um, you know, the quality of the site might be poor, but the species is super, super rare. Um, and I would think that we would still wanna track that even if you call it something else, if it's like a lower tier important site or maybe just in a, you know, import, important population or something like that. Um, because I'd, I would hate to lose sight of those just because there's so much focus on natural communities, which is, is a much harder thing to assess and look at and takes a lot more expertise as well. So just to throw that out there. I think that's an important consideration. And I think regardless of whether something becomes a special site or not, we should always keep track of um, rare species occurrences. Well, couldn't we have rare um, plant sites or natural community and then, well, rare plant sites and then rare or rather important plant sites and important um, other sites or important animal sites? I mean, well, I think we should just say rare species sites. I wouldn't, I don't think we should be, I mean, natural community. Yeah, I think we should just be rare species site. I don't think we need to break it into, you know, what classification it is. I mean, natural one, communities include both plants and animals. One question that I posed to Christine, and it may be that there is a system and I'm just not familiar with it, but um, is, you know, how these things have been tracked in the past and how we might track them, continue to track them or create a better system for tracking them into the future. So I don't know if Lonnie or other folks who've been on the committee for a long time know the answer to that. Uh, I haven't figured it out myself. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, Kim and I had discussed this, that we have this 
uh, all the work that Nancy and Emily put into creating the Google Drive and you know, now there are folders for each of the important sites with a sort of protocol for how to uh, report your visits. And, you know, there was a lot of effort put into that organization. And then at the same time, I know for myself, when I feel, I feel like sometimes I don't have the expertise that I feel might be necessary to fill out some of the forms. And then all that information is there. But, uh, you know, Kim, you were talking about like a simpler app that would might be just easy to put, take a picture, write down, just jot down a couple notes and keep track of and just make the visits a little bit, uh, the process is streamlined, simplified, easier. I mean, yeah, so what I was suggesting was maybe a database. I know we have the web viewer where you can view important sites that Nancy shared. I don't, I don't know who created that or um, where the underlying data lives, but like the Roadkill app, it's real easy to create a Survey One Two Three app. So we could have a way, you know, a database that's linked to the GIS that could track information as it's, you know, of when it was last cited or when it was last visited, um, pretty easily. If, so, if something like that was created. So there's a reason why we haven't done that and a reason why the web viewer isn't owned by the county. Um, and it comes down to concerns about FOIA because if we put a lot of detailed information into exactly precisely where rare species are, there's always the, the there's, there's always the possibility that someone might, you know, it, it's never happened, but there's always the possibility that someone might ask where this thing is, even if it's on someone else's private property, and we'd have to tell them. Um, that, that's always been the concern. I hear that, but the flip side of that is that, um, you know, the county staff person is like, is the only constant of this committee, right? Everybody else might rotate out. So where that data lives and how it's stored is gonna always constantly be changing if the people are constantly changing and there's no central location for it to be backed up, right? Yeah, I, and, I totally agree. And I mean, given the fact that this committee has now been around for, for decades and not once to my knowledge have we received a single FOIA request, um, it, it doesn't seem to be a founded concern. I guess, yeah, I would also say, I mean, the statewide programs are also government, so they're all foyable, you know, so they have that same risk. Um, I don't know. And so that's similar information is collected and is in terms of those rare plant communities with DCRs. Well, the natural heritage programs, yeah. So DCRs, natural heritage program tracks all the rare species and not insignificant natural communities in Virginia. And every state has one of those. Um, they used to be nature conservancy. So maybe they, then they would have been more protected, but now they're all government. Yeah. And so I've, I, I've had this, I, I've wondered this for a while and I actually thought about, you know, like maybe asking some colleagues, you know, some people at DCR, how they handle it. Um, how would they an answer requests like that if someone says, okay, can you tell me where such and such endangered species is located? What would they do? Would they, they just have to say, okay, it's, it's over here. <laughs> or is there some provision within, is there some provision with FOIA, within FOIA that allows for protection of, of that sort of information? I don't believe there's any discretion in the law. Um, so we just have to be careful not to read into something. Well, I think you have to remember that there are federal statutes, regulations, and so forth that classify animals and plants uh, as 
endangered, those that are listed, things like that. Um, and that's what we really ought to be in compliance with when it comes to the to the data. You know, if the federal government or the state government um, identifies things that are endangered in, in locations where they are, and there are groups that work on those, um, as an agency of the of the county government or as a committee of the county government, uh, we the, the committee has to comply with certain rules and regulations, I would guess. And for instance, the Google Docs uh, information, um, what policy oversees the data and information that's kept there? And is that in compliance with something that's required? So I'm just making the point that we already have rules and regulations out there that I'm sure are guidelines for what we can give people to or know, or know about. Well, I mean, if anyone requested information in Google Docs, we'd have to provide it. Because that, that is a county, that is a county resource. All right. Um, Bruce, you had your hand up. Yes. Um, I have several points. I guess number one is that uh, this was all started by getting a asking for a description for what, what would be a, uh, an important site, a definition for an important site. So for me, the, the description of an important site is that it's local. It's not the state locals, it's the county important site. So if plant community is rare to the county, that's what matters. It isn't that it's statewide or countrywide. So that's where the eagles nesting is still a rare thing. It's not like they're not abundant all throughout the whole county. Um, so we, whether they're delisted or not, I don't think becomes the issue. I think it's uh, keeping the, in mind that our role as a committee is to support the board of supervisors. I think that needs to stay at our forefront we're not here as our own, I feel, I feel like we're not here to do our own work. Everything is in support of the board and, in, and by extension in support of the whole county. Um, I don't know anything about FOIA. And so to, to, uh, to make observations on it, I think is kind of fruitless. It would be more fruitful, I think, to get someone who knew something about that rather than worry about it. Um, also, there's an app called Picture This, which has the ability to sort what you take pictures of into, well, if you get the personal version, your garden. So anything you take a picture of, it'll store on your phone as your quote garden so you could do something similar you know if you went to an important site you could set it up and so anything time you took a picture it would store it that way so there's already apps built for that you don't have to reinvent the wheel so those are just some of my points let's you know keep our heads on uh, for what we're doing uh, i had another point long ago which was um in terms of the spotted lantern fly I feel like what Kim said was talking to the Board of Supervisors, getting political leadership behind it, news stories. Most of the county landowners, if you send them a letter, no matter how well designed, it's not going it, to, you know, it's going to be one out of 100, uh, I would guess, would probably be a good return. And I'm guessing it would be a lot lower than that if you just send one to all the landowners. That's like the ideal, but I think the reality is a lot less. It probably reach a lot more landowners if you get a story on channel 29 or on the daily progress. And doing that sort of thing, I think is a much more realistic. I mean, we can put in a lot of work to try and send out a letter to every landowner if that's even possible. You know, there's no listing of all the landowners that uh, we could as committee members access easily. You can't just say, hey, Kim, send a letter to all the landowners. You know, that's not her job. I don't think there is anyone's job who can do that. So 
If I got a letter in the mail about the spotted lanternfly, I probably wouldn't see it. That's the reality. It wouldn't come through, kind of like how Emily said, you know, did you see something? Did I see something? Unless it was, you know, gold exploding firecrackers attached to it, you know, I wouldn't see it. You know, I have a hard enough time just seeing the bills, uh, you know, because there's so much other stuff in the mail. So those are just the things we wanted to contribute. Bruce, you are reiterating it needs to be a TikTok video. And Emma, you need to do a song and dance. <laughs> I'll dress up as a spotted lantern fly. You know what? I think you've got <laughs> something there. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, and I think it's also, I, I'd like the, I, I would reaffirm that notion that, yeah, we are concerned about things that are county rare. There are other agencies whose job it is to look after federal and threatened species. Um, my point was just that if something is federally or is federally listed, then it automatically, you know, becomes of importance to us as well. But, but our, our primary our primary goal is definitely to look after county biodiversity, which, which means that we may care about some, some things, some species and habitats that are not, that, that are not on the state's radar. Um, after all, everything before something becomes federally listed or, um, or even state listed, it's, it becomes rare locally. Um, and, and usually by the time something gets federal status, a lot of those things, it's too late. Well, I want, oh, Emily, do you have your hand up or Kim? Yep, I do. Okay. I do. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to chime in as someone who's spent some time working on the Google Drive that I, that I share the concern that, that there, are, that it is sort of, it isn't a sort of centralized place, but the ownership of it is, is very decentralized. And I think Kim's right as people come and go off the committee. Um, that there is a danger that um, that material will get lost um, um, over time, and so I do think that that is something that the committee probably should should address and think about at some point. Um, I do share Lonnie's sentiment of sort of a little bit of concern over just um, you know again. Like you said, I don't think anybody's looking for FOIA like saying, "Hey, I need to know this." But um, just even when I think about important sites and some of the information that's on there, like I think somebody uploaded all of Mo Stevens' notes. Um, you know, I think a lot of the data that originally, at least my understanding, led to these important sites was a lot of naturalists going out and exploring the county, getting, um, getting personal permission to visit somebody's land and see what was there. And, um, you know, that permission was given to an individual and probably didn't feel like it extended to this point where it is being shared so widely perhaps. Um, and I don't really know that we track like exactly like who owns the, who owns important sites and to like always let them know you own some land that encompasses an important site. And if that gets sold, do we really contact the new landowner and let them know and so it would be a little bit um, awkward if there was, you know, other people like Lonnie said, who might take the information and decide that they needed to go see this important site that was on private land um, without even the landowner necessarily being aware that, that their property was labeled as an important site. Um, so that's just, I don't know, just something that, that popped into my mind, but I, I wholeheartedly agree that, that um, an overhaul of of what is there and what should be there, um, and and figuring out how to how to make sure that that the data that we feel is important and and belongs to the committee and on the committee should should uh, find a way to to be more, um, uh, you know, whether it's a email address that's like you know natural heritage you know, Admiral Natural Heritage at Gmail, and then there's like a managed account where somebody has the job of managing it. And so at least, and then you can give ownership of the files to that account or something like that could help, but also maybe, maybe some of it would eventually also reside with the county. I don't really know the answer to that, but it's yeah. something 
consider. Yeah, I would do wish there's a, at least a managed account that owns the, um, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I wouldn't say no to a database. I mean, <laughs> but. I would think that Kim could set up a share drive, a share point folder, Kim, and you can manage who can go in it and who can't, who can edit. And then when people go off the committee, you just have to go in and remove that person's um, access to that folder. I would think moving. I would move all your Google files to a SharePoint file since they really are, this is a county committee. It should be on our SharePoint. Um, I can help you with that if you want me to, Kim. Towards oh yeah, no, I, uh, thanks Carolyn. I No, that's definitely on my radar. So that I guess um, is a different, <laughs> it is an option, um, but uh, it's complicated. I've tried to do it for another group for the wildlife group um, and it's it's not that easy to do. So I've been trying to research what other boards and committees do. I don't know that they have the same kind of sensitive information and the same kind of concerns like Emily you were just uh, expressing. Um, but yes, the Google Drive is definitely not approved by the county. It doesn't have the security. Um, and so that's not something that um, I think would be supported, you know, uh, but um, but I think somebody in IT can help you take everything from the group. Once you set up the folder, I think IT might help you get everything moved over there. Yeah, it's not a problem to move it there. It's accessibility is the issue and also um, accessibility for the group. And then also other people could access it. Um, and I, I, I'll just say, I think it's extremely unlikely. I know the statewide natural heritage programs, of course they could be FOIA'd, but they have like an information request system. And when they get information requests, they generalize information that they give to people to try to prevent, you know, people going to an orchid site or something and trying to dig them up. You can't prevent it hundred percent. I mean, and I, I suppose if there was a FOIA request that would have to be met, but I guess there might need to be sort of like weighing and balancing the security and stability of the information from the past into the future versus that maybe what I would view as a very minimal risk that someone might try to do something maliciously to find out information about these sites. Um, but I also wanted to follow on something Lonnie said about the state and federally listed populations. Um, those may be on the natural, the statewide natural heritage programs radar and that they're in their database, but they have very few staff people and they don't monitor them regularly. So I think there's still, there's value in um, not just tracking the county important resources, but even the state and federal ones are unlikely to be tracked very well or very frequently given the resources that those statewide programs have. Well, so this brings up, we've got more important work to do. Um, but uh, I hope that Lonnie, do you I hope that people still feel that it makes sense to kind of codify the criteria and uh, go ahead and if, if you guys can work on that in your policy committee, that would be great. And then bring something back to us. And then in the meantime, uh, we will make sure that we're working on getting that Google Drive information someplace that it can be secure, which sounds, I see how this is difficult. Giving us access to it, but putting it in a different folder, so. Yeah, and I have to say that even as an IT, a professional IT user, I find um, some people's SharePoint some people's SharePoint implementation is extremely difficult to use. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> right, and I'm guessing that a lot of information because I've sort of searched through the Google Drive and I, I'm not finding a lot of historical information. So I'm guessing that like maybe Lonnie you have it or other people have it saved elsewhere and not on the Google Drive, but or maybe it just doesn't exist, I don't know. I, I think some, well, yeah, I mean, that's, I think it gets down to that 
paradox. And we, we can talk offline about what, what historical information you're looking for, but I, I think there has been reticence to put everything in a place um, that, that could be very easily searched. And so maybe some of that stuff was never put down somewhere in a physical location because people were concerned about, you know, someone getting access to it. So, so some stuff is probably just in, probably just, you know, as continuity of the group and, and people in people's heads. But if you're looking for something specific, let me know and I'll try to find it. Um, well, you know, there you go. We've got information in people's heads and people in Google Drive in the future SharePoint. <laughs> But at any rate, not to make light of any of it, um, I'm going to look to Lonnie's group, uh, the policy group, to come up uh, with some criteria. And if you can report back to us on at our next meeting, that would be fantastic. Um, and at this point, at this moment, I'm just going to digress a little bit before we uh, go to these the committee report outs, because. Uh, September 30th is the end of a term for Michael and for Emily and also for Kenan. And so, but I know that Michael and Emily are going to be stepping off the committee. They're not gonna be renewing uh, their membership. And I just wanna take a minute to thank them for all their, their contribution that they've made uh, and their um, thoughtful input and, you know, we've already talked about Emily and all the work that she put into creating that Google Doc and organizing this information and so much of accessing information. She did that with Nancy. It's just being having it organized. So I just really want to thank you for all your efforts with that. And of course, your beautiful pictures. Um, and uh, Emily and I talked a little bit. So Emma, you'll be happy to know that we can get her out, hopefully, to your beautiful spot and uh, taking some Yay. pictures. And she has agreed to lend some of her expertise to looking at Yay. some of the wetland organisms there. So that would be so fun. <laughs> I can make sure to have the paddle boards out and we can go and see, see what we can find. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> I can't wait to meet you in person. Thanks. Yeah. Same. Yeah. And also thank you to Michael. Uh, you know, you helped us to get our landowner uh, outreach letter going and got all these great resources to really get the landowner uh, resource page up and going, the reorganization of that. So I really appreciate uh, your efforts with all of that. And I know that you're going to be out there doing some important work with the electoral board, I believe. So Thank you for your time. And you've got your hand up, Mike, Michael. Well, I, I, I just want to say thank you to everybody else on the committee. I, I think the committee membership right now is really strong. And so I, as I said to Christine earlier, I feel a lot less guilty about leaving. Uh, I, it's, it's in good hands. And I've, I think I also learned a lot more than I, than I gave. So, um, uh, I, but as, I, as you've said, I've got other things on my plate and they're taking up a lot more time than I expected. So. Uh, I, I hope to stay plugged in as a volunteer and interested citizen and wish you guys the best of luck in carrying this all forward. So uh, you're on a great path. Oh, great. great, thank you. And Michael, we'll get you, if you get that drone out over at uh, Darden Cow Park and keeping an eye on our no mo areas or conservation mo areas, we of course greatly appreciate that as well. And we'll put yeah. you on the friends of the NHC. There you go. Well. Are you are you a good are you an expert drone pilot? I'm not an expert. Uh, I haven't <laughs> crashed anything yet, but I'm not an expert. Okay, because we do have a couple sites where that would come in handy. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me know. Might never see your drone again, though. But. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that might be operator error, that'd be okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we we ended up going through like a renewal cycle and uh, who was it? I renewed and 
I'm trying to think who else Emma had to reapply. And who am I missing? There was somebody else. And then Kenan, you're on with us. I, we, of course, we hope that you will um, reapply because your term is up. Mm -hmm. the end yeah. of the month. I'll, I'll have to look at, into that. I'd like to. I, as you know, I haven't been very, uh, this previous spring, I just had to stop the committee. So I sort of feel like I had a break um, in the committee participation. So yeah, I'd like to renew and then eventually get more involved. Just uh, life demands or such that I couldn't, couldn't participate fully this spring. Um, Lonnie, you had mentioned, what did you just say? Did you say something about, uh, you just said to Michael, I couldn't hear that, but I, I, was that something about um, drone pilot or what, what was that? Oh, just we have some sites that are vertical in nature. And yeah. um, in the past, we've tried to enlist some of the local rock climbers. And, and I got I got pretty close to getting something you could actually like rappel down one of the sites to huh. uh, to look at it. But but obviously this committee has not been one that I think has a lot of rock climbers. So for those cliffside sites, um, I don't know, maybe drones. Yeah, that, that could be a possibility. We have a drone that we don't use very much. So that might be a possibility of flying, you know, flying something like that. We can yeah. talk about that. Certainly the, the newest county heritage site um, at Arrowhead Farms is an almost vertical site, the part where it has a, um, a the part that everyone wants to save is right on the top of the ridge and then it goes down. And it always looks, you know, you kind of want to stand and look over the edge without getting too close. So a drone would be nice for something like that to at least, you know, monitor it at certain times. You also have to climb up the hillside just to get to it. And that's always a, a good mile and a half at an angle like this of upward Was there uh, just to get is there a certain season where that'd be ideal? Yeah, I would say for the rock outcrop communities, usually um, it's usually early spring. Yeah. Um, when you get by the time you get to um, by the time you get to this this time of year, everything is sort of dried up, right, yeah. or disappeared. Yeah, spring wildflowers and such. That might be something that could be done. Fly one of these things. Yep. We can talk about that, but organize something for spring. That, that would be great. Thank you for lending that. We are, so, um, and I just wanna say, Kenan, you should have gotten an email from the clerk. So inviting you to uh, fill the application again. So just maybe look back through your uh, emails and see if you can find that. But we're glad that you are going to uh, stick with us. Yeah. I'll hope at some point I hope to get more involved. Yeah, um, I will. I think I did get that email. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Hey, so, Chris, I got my letter and I'm extended out to 2025. I think. Yeah. You. Fantastic. Very good. All right. Well, I wanted uh, to just be able to do a report out of the our working groups and um, in terms of the, of course, the Education Outreach Committee. We have not had an opportunity to meet, but Carolyn has generously offered to, um, if we have a, a daytime, uh, that she could help us with the meeting. And she's going to send me the dates, and then I will get back out to you guys so that we could potentially do that. And it sounds like the policy committee has is will be meeting. Um, so as far as what I do want to report in terms of education and outreach is. Uh, that we are continuing. I've been working, continue to work with Piedmont Master Gardeners with this uh, plant uh, Piedmont Northern Native campaign and working with the area um, nurseries. And so that's been pretty successful. We've got like six or seven nurseries that are on board with um, advertising native plants and then also selling, selling the little native plant guide, the booklet, which is great. So, um, so has there been talk about um, yet about redoing, redoing the guide? I, I've been kind of been out, out of the loop. So 
but just as one of the the former lead authors, I was just kind of curious. You know, I I haven't heard anything about that. Um, I did. It sounds like there are a couple cases of the the booklets that are that have yep. been printed. And I just got out of a meeting with the Piedmont Master Gardeners, and they really said there sounds like there's a lot of interest uh, for selling them at these at the nurseries. So, at any rate, yeah. and then Emma, Emma and I talked about uh, we just need to set a date is setting up a table at either one of the farmers markets and do, picking a weekend this fall. Uh, where we can do a little bit of that outreach similar to what we did for the, the pollinators uh, festival down in Scottsville. Great, yeah, in the past I brought, I think Monticello Visitor Center has sold them too. Oh, okay. Yeah, they seem to be pretty popular. Yeah, we have been, but they haven't had them recently. And But I was also thinking, you know, when we have um, uh, plant sales, like with the, the, at Tufton, Maybe it, we're not having an open house this year. We're just having plant sales on uh, uh, October 9th, but maybe next spring we could have, if things can be less restricted, we could have uh, sales at the actual um, spring plant sale, especially the wildflower one in, in or the um, native plant sale in, in April uh, at the nursery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Peggy, if you have like, any tabling, maybe that would be a place to table some of uh, some of our materials about like good land owner stewardship practices. Yeah, we could, we could do that for this this coming event. I mean, we, I could get some materials and just have it there for people to take. Um, yeah. It's and October 9th, and then we're having an apple tasting on October 23rd, and and maybe some materials could be just available for people you wouldn't have to man it per yeah. se yeah. well that's that's half the fun well yeah <laughs> i know <laughs> that's true well yeah. i'll bring that up yeah that's two ways to get information out to people yeah yeah that sounds great um do, does the policy committee have anything that they want to report other than the fact that you guys are going to be meeting um, th that's it. Just the fact that we're going to be meeting, um, Kim, um, you and I might want to touch base before that meeting to see what kind of, cause I know we'd like to discuss what's been going on with stream health and see if there's more, um, some, some more tailored input that we could provide that might be helpful to you. So maybe we should talk. Um, but, but that's sure. it. Um, is, is this the point where I can re report some, well, let me know when I can report the, the cool resource that I found, but. Let, let's, I just wanna make sure that Leah's got a chance. She's been doing some exciting things. So I want Leah to uh, be able to report out uh, what she's been working on with the Bobcat study. You want me to go? Yeah, that'd be great. And then Lonnie, <laughs> we'll get back to you. Okay, all right. Well, I've been, trying to figure out kind of where, how the county would benefit from identifying wildlife corridors for the last two years, well, more than two years since I worked on a subcommittee for the um, Biodiversity Action Plan. And in the process have met a lot of people and have learned a lot of things and done a lot of research. So the outcome of it is that I discovered that bobcat can be considered as representing other species, a, a diversity of species, because they eat a lot of different types of prey and they also utilize a number of types of habitat. So um, it's hypothesized that they could be an indicator species or an umbrella species. It depends on which ecologist you talk to and which terminology they use. So um, I had started bumping around an idea with somebody from Smithsonian Conservation Biology Research Institute like a year and a half ago. And lo and behold, then as Kim knows, um, a new professor joined the ranks at Virginia Tech um, like early summer, I guess. And um, he is, his background is working with wildlife corridors and he's in the Department of Fish and Wildlife um, Conservation at Virginia Tech. 
And so I started talking with him um, and another person at, um, at the Smithsonian facility. And long story short, we put together a proposed study, which I sent you all a summary on, uh, to actually trap and radio call our bobcat in northwestern Albemarle County, and then follow their movements and use that information to um, look at the habitat they're using, as well as any corridors or pathways they might be using. And then uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation has been doing some modeling for a couple of years on trying to identify potential wildlife corridors across the state. And they uh, believe based on modeling that there would be some in Northwest Albemarle County um, pretty much generally adjacent to uh, Shenandoah National Park. And so the data from this proposed study would be used, not just as I said, to look at habitat that's being used and to look at quarters, but also to develop a couple of computer models to compare against the computer model that DCR has developed. And the, the guy from DCR who's been doing all this modeling um, it strongly supports the project and wrote us a letter of support uh, to submit with a funding, a grant request that we put in yesterday. And um, we got letters of support from a number of other groups and individuals as well. And the um, grant proposal or submittal went to the Bama Works Group, which is the Dave Matthews Band Foundation. And it was apparently not like a lot of other grant applications. It was not like responding to a request for proposals where you write like an essay. There was 37 specific questions. Many were hard to answer, like what are the demographics um, do you would you reach with your project? And I had looked at a number of other funding sources and pretty much everything has switched over to funding um, racial equity, basically, um, diversity and um, people rather than biodiversity. And the um, Obama Works Fund, fortunately, one of its four areas that it will consider um, grants for is environmental stewardship. So we submitted it under that. And of the interest in the 37 questions, only one was what is the scope of this project or what is your project? the answer had to fit within 300 characters. That includes spaces. So basically the entire project had to be summarized in two sentences. We couldn't get it in three sentences. So it was a lot of work um, putting this together. And I talked to the um, administrator for the fund and he said that um, outreach uh, to lower income groups would be a very important consideration in any grants, uh, grant proposals. So I added in um, a larger education component than I had originally intended. So in the grant proposal uh, is the thought that we would not only take data from the outcome of the study to um, educate or provide information to landowners about how they can um, make additional um, positive decisions for wildlife and how they manage their land. Um, you know, like it might be leaving certain strips of, of their property um, unmowed, right? Like for ground nesting birds or for small mammals, little kangaroo mice, things that bobcat would eat, would also provide shelter potentially for bobcat, that kind of thing. Um, but not only reaching out to landowners, but because landowners have money, um, according to the Obama Works administrator, um, that's not considered good enough. We have to find a way to reach out to lower income people. So I added in doing presentations to a number of youth groups like the, um, well, 4-H isn't necessarily low income and neither is young farmers, but the Boys and Girls Clubs of Virginia, um, is more that group. And Wild Rock is in uh, Northwest Albemarle County is already, has already been providing um, education programs to Albemarle City Schools, as has Camp Albemarle, um, which is a program through the Thomas Jefferson Soil and Water Conservation District. 
So I've kind of linked up with those groups and said, um, you know, are you interested in this receiving information, depending on what we find from the study, but are you interested in incorporating this potentially into educate your educational programs? And their answer was, we'd be thrilled. So that's a lot of information. Y'all have any questions? No. Okay. I just, Leah, I just want to say, I think that's super cool that you included that education component and just to be able to have a venue where you can talk about uh, bobcats and these amazing credit creatures that are predators and are important in, you know, the ecological, you know, have a play an important role in the ecology of our landscape. So thank you so much for all of your efforts and exciting work that you're doing. Thank you. Well, we'll we will see. We are getting there. Um, since Virginia Tech would be taking the lead on this project, they'd be getting a graduate student to do this research. The way they do their funding is in the budget, they have to have $78,000 for the graduate student because Virginia Tech pays tuition, room and board, um, something else, I forget what the other thing is, for a student. So it was a little weird having to submit that to a nonprofit foundation that's used to funding smaller nonprofit groups um, for, for different, very different types of projects. Uh, so, Anyway, it was, it was really an interesting twist on doing this. And yet when I talked to the project administrator, the program administrator for the um, funding, he was very interested. And I'm hoping that this will catch people's attention because it's gonna be so different from what they're used to. And it's a good, by applying for this grant, it's a good, has been a good evolution because the original idea was all science-based. And, you know, I knew that we could, hopefully take some valuable information to landowners and uh, partner with other groups like the um, Resource Conservation Assistance Program and Virginia Conservation Assistance Program to, to, to help landowners make better decisions. But it was only by Obama work saying, hey, we need more that I realized we could also use this in outreach um, in much broader, in a broader situation, you know, to rotary groups and young farmers groups and the Farm Bureau and, cause they have educational programs for farmers. So it could be very far reaching and that would mean building more support, which could potentially get us more funding to then look at Bobcat south of the interstate to see if the interstate is being a barrier genetically um, for the bobcat to migrate and um, mix their genes, basically. So then we start getting into the transportation quarter aspect. And there's just, you know, on and on and on. There's a lot of potential. And because we're fortunate, the bobcat seem to represent other species. And bobcat are kind of a cool, sexy species. You know, it gives us opportunity to get people's attention. Very cool. Uh, Leah, can I just ask, what's the final product of your study? Is is there in your grant? It sounds like a really great thing, especially because bobcats, I think, are one of the few things that prey on deer, and deer, of course, are impacting a lot of the native plant species. Um, so it seems like a, a good thing. Can you? But I, did you mention what the final product is, or have you developed that yet? In your well, it, it, it's 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 involved. There's quite a bit. The final product will be. Um, information in terms of habitat and then there will be several different like three different well two different computer models that will be created and then they will be compared to the one that DCR is using to see how um, online or how accurate the DCR uh, model is mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm very grateful that the DCR guy who's been doing all this modeling for a few years is looking forward to the data because he wants to field test his data. There is no data on populations of almost any um, animal species in the state. So um, anyway, so there's two computer models that will then be, um, valid, be used to validate or confirm the accuracy of the state model. And wow. then they're also going to set up camera traps um, in 
different habit identified habitat areas to see, uh, to validate, well, to see what other species are using the habitat that the bobcat are using. So we can also validate the um, general assumption that has not been fully tested uh, that says that bobcat are basically an indicator species. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, nice. What do we have up here? Yes. Oh, before, uh, Lonnie, before you go, I just want to quick mention, um, we just have a few minutes left and Carolyn does need to leave right at 7.30. So I'm sorry, but we have to kind of move through quick. That's okay, this won't take very much time. So. So, so this is a really fascinating um, site that um, you guys probably, have, those of you in botanists probably have heard of Alan Weekly. This is a project he has been involved with. But this, um, this actually allows um, access to all the herbarium specimens um, from herbaria across the, the country. And so the interesting thing is here, so I've just put in a sample search of um, one of my favorite species, climbing fern. Um, and then I can do a um, I can do a search, and it actually shows me all the herbarium specimens that people have collected of this species. And so you can see, for example, like here's one in um, Augusta County near Stewart's Draft. Um, and so these are all his, and a lot of these are historical. Some of these were, you know, they have ones in here. There were, well, here's one from 1977. Um, but there's there's some of these specimens that are in Albemarle County as well. So this is an interesting resource in terms of like tracking down interesting occurrences of plants um, in, in Albemarle County. Um, you know, obviously, as you, you track these down, you want to, you know, find out if it's on private property, find out who owns the property, follow standard procedures as far as that goes. But um, I think it's just a great resource in terms of like um, being able to find out um, the history of what 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 grew where and when, um, both current and and in the past. Um, and tracking some of these these sites down, I've certainly found some occurrences of plants that are no longer here. But even knowing the history of where things used to be is is very fascinating, and this is the same sort of information that ultimately gets put into like the floor of Virginia and other resources. This is the basis of why they um, believe certain species occurred in certain counties. So, Can you send us that link or? Um... Yeah, I can. Yeah, that looks, uh, it's an app you say, or no. No, no, it's, it's a website. It's a website, okay, good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks, that, that would be really useful, yeah. Um, and there, there are, you know, particular, of particular interest is the um, Harville Stevens herbarium is in here. Um, you know, Mo Stevens made a lot of collection of collections of plants in Albemarle County, and so a lot of a lot of these occurrences um, are things that um, are things that occurred in Albemarle. So so that's that's pretty neat. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, okay, that's hey, cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Lonnie. Yep. Yeah. That's it. All right, fantastic. I I just have one little quick thing. I um, received an email through uh, Prism from Beth Moselle about the sighting of wavy basket grass over at um, board the boars on the boars head property. So I've been trying to reach out to them about uh, you know. Can they take action and just create some awareness? And so has the person who made the sighting as well. And so it just brought to me, it was like, well, is that something that, that you know, thinking about like, should there be a database of the sightings of these really awful invasive plants? And, or at least, you know, do we have some kind of policy about contacting the landowners to do something about it? All those questions came to my mind. Uh, but I just wanted to make you guys aware of that. And I said that I would just let you know. So that's for a future discussion, I think. Yeah, um, I naturalist. That's, that's troubling, yeah. Yeah, so at any rate, 
I hate to leave on such a, a bad note. A bad note there. And so just you can put that out of your heads, even though I laid that out there. Um, but you guys have a fantastic September. Enjoy the cooler weather. It's great to see all Beautiful of day. you. Yeah. And um, thank you for all of your work and your time. And goodbye to Emily and Michael. But we will be seeing you on out there, hopefully. Yeah, no, bye. Sure. Yeah. So it's been a right. pleasure, everyone. All right. Bye. Thank All right. you. Have a great evening, you guys. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, bye -bye. Karen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Rod, for joining us. Bye. All right. Have a great evening. <laughs>